I've approached this evening with eagerness and excitement. Um, the last few Wednesdays, Wednesdays, a bishop has been teaching, and I'm so thankful for our bishop. He taught a series, the Trilogy of Biblical Contrasts. And what a tremendous job our bishop always does. But I've been eager to bring this Bible study because when you haven't preached in a while, if you're a minister, it becomes like fire shut up in your bones. So I feel the Word of God, it's like a fire shut up in my bone. And some of you, you can relate to that. You may not minister the Word, but you teach Bible studies and you share your testimony. I believe when God brings us out of sin, we should have a fire and a zeal that's in our body and in our heart, and we need to let it out. Praise God. But indeed, excited to bring the Bible study. And uh, tonight's topic is growing in God's grace. Growing in God's grace and I pray that this Bible study will be a, a help to us. But when we look to the Word of God, we will discover that grace, it's really one of the most important concepts in the Word of God. And it is indeed, it's a necessity of salvation, but it goes well beyond that. As we begin to study grace, we understand that the beauty and the wonder of grace, they're most clearly expressed through the Scriptures and through the promises of the Word of God that are revealed to us through Scripture. But also we see the grace of God. It was embodied in Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful day when you have the revelation that Jesus Christ, He was the Word. And when you understand that the Word was God and the Word was with God, and you understand that the Word was made of flesh, that's a beautiful day when you understand that grace was embodied in Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for that revelation. But it is indeed it's a powerful truth also to realize that when Jesus robed himself in flesh, that he chose Calvary. He chose the cross to reveal his character to mankind. You see, the Bible says that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. You see, the Word of God says that God is love. And when Jesus wrapped himself in flesh, he was identifying with a man. And he was revealing his character on Calvary. He was revealing to all of mankind that he loved man enough that he would lay down his life for a friend. And then he goes on to say, he said, you are my friends if you will hear my word and you will keep my commandment. So we understand a principle right there about grace, that we understand that grace is a free gift. Because God gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So grace is a free gift, but it's also predicated on our obedience to the Word of God. So in order to receive the grace of God, we need to be submitted to His Word. I want to be submitted to His Word because I want to grow in the grace of God. Hallelujah. So when we grow in the grace of God, we will come to a richer understanding of His Word because grace is, again, is connected to submission to the Word. The Apostle Paul writing in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 8, he said this, he said, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I pause there just to point out that we receive the power of God. We receive ability from God. We receive the anointing from God. It's because of His purpose, but it's also because of His grace. You see, if we only had purpose and we did not have the power of God, it, it would be useless. And if we had all power without purpose, it would be self-serving. But I'm thankful that when Jesus went to the cross and he gave up his life, he not only began to deposit purpose into mankind, but he also began to liberate them from the grip of sin. And when he was put in that grave, he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And when he rose again, he said, I'm not going to leave you 
comfortless, uh, but I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you. And when you receive my spirit, you're going to be endued with power from on high. And he said, you're going to be a witness unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world. What was he saying? He's saying, my grace is not only going to save you, but my grace is going to give you power and it's going to give you purpose. I'm thankful for the power and the grace of God that resonates in our life. If you're thankful for that, give God a mighty hand clap of praise. Praise God. It's like fire shut up in my bones. I'm thankful for the grace of God. Praise God. It's by His own purpose and His own grace that we have ability, that we have an anointing. Again, it's not by our might nor by power, but it's by the Spirit, saith the Lord. Verse number 10, he goes on to say this, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So when we begin to consider the totality of the Word of God, we begin to glean some definitions. And one of the prominent definitions that is shared is the the unmerited favor of God. In other words, it's the unearned favor of God. It's it's God's approval. It's God's kindness. But from that, I expand that definition, and there's several definitions that that I list here, and it's really just expanded from that one and and from the totality of Scripture. But here's another definition of grace. It, It is the love of God shown to the undeserving and the unworthy. You see, when we were born, we were born into sin, and we lived in sin. We were shaped in sin. And because of sin, we begin to live a lifestyle that was separated from God. And But while we were yet sinners, I'm thankful that God commended His love toward us uh, while we were still undeserving, while you were still unworthy, while you were still evil. God still, He began to extend His love to you. And what was that? That was the unmerited favor of God. That was the grace of God reaching for you. And again, at Calvary, He began to identify identify his character. We sang about it earlier. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. What is God drawing us here tonight with? He's drawing us with his grace and his unmerited favor. Hallelujah. So another definition of grace could be this, the free gift of God. The free gift of God extended to fallen mankind. Another definition that we could apply to grace is this, the fulfilled promises of God. It's the unmerited favor of God, but it's the fulfilled promises of God. But also we could define grace this way. It is the description that God gives himself. It is the description that God gives himself. Consider Exodus chapter 34, verse number 6. Moses writes this, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. You see, the key understanding is this, God's grace toward us, it originates in His character. It originates in His character. You, You see, God desires for all of mankind to receive the free gift of His loving kindness. For even the prophet Isaiah, he alluded to this in Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 18. And this is talking about the grace of God and the justice of God. In verse 18, Isaiah, he recorded this. He said, therefore, the Lord, he longs to be gracious to you. He longs for it. He longs to love you. He he longs to wrap his arms around you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice, and how blessed are those who long for Him. You see, when we delight in the Lord, God's going to begin to give us the desires of our heart. That doesn't mean we're going to 
receive everything we prayed about, but he's going to begin to establish our heart, and it's going to be in alignment with his word and the promises of his word. If you want to receive the promises of the word of God, all you need to begin to do is begin to thank God for his mercy. You begin to thank God for his grace. You begin to align yourself with the word of God, and he desires to give us his grace. Oh, are you thankful for that tonight? He's waiting to show you compassion. Oh, powerful. He's waiting to extend His grace to you. You see, God's perfect nature, it dispenses perfect and fair judgment. And His position as judge of the whole earth, it necessitates that He judge mankind to, according to His righteousness. And God is not only the creator of all of heaven and earth, but He's also the sustainer of earth. But also He is the righteous judge of all the earth. When you realize he's the creator and the sustainer, but when you realize he's also the judge, I'm also thankful to know that he's a gracious judge. He's a fair judge. He's a just judge. And he waits on high to extend compassion unto you. Oh, hallelujah. You see, because if any of us stood before the throne, the judgment throne of God, none of us could stand. But it's because of his grace one day we'll be able to stand before him and hear, well done. Thy good and faithful servant. Consider what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 50, verse number 9. He said, And and the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge Selah. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, he said, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. What a powerful promise in the Word of God. He will save us. So if we know that the Lord is the lawgiver, there's only one lawgiver and there's only one judge. And when we know that the Lord, He's the lawgiver and He's the judge, we should ask this. What makes a fair and an equitable judge? What makes a fair judge? What makes an equitable judge? Or could we say it this way? What makes a a good judge? And I began to consider that, and I did some research, read some articles, even from some businesses of school and businesses of law. And here's some, here's some characteristics that identify a good judge. And the first is this, knowledge of the law. Knowledge of the law. Here's a second trait to make an equitable judge. Good self-awareness. You see, God is fully aware of who He is. He is the only potentate. Here's another characteristic that makes an equitable judge. Effective communication. Effective communication. Here's another trait that makes a fair judge, and it it is this. Cognitive empathy. In other words, empathetic accuracy. How could a God that is far off empathize with mankind? We could reason that he could empathize with mankind because he is omnipotent, meaning he is all-knowing. But God says, I don't want to just identify with man because of my knowledge, but I want to wrap myself in flesh so that I can identify with every emotion of mankind. I want to wrap myself in flesh so that I can be tempted in every point as humankind has been tempted. Yet without sin, we serve a God that never failed. He never succumbed to sin. And because He overcame sin, we can stand before his throne and receive grace oh hallelujah if you want to know Jesus is God just understand that there's only one judge there's only one judge what what is empathy empathy is the action of understanding it's being fully aware of something being sensitive to it and sharing the feelings of someone or something. It's sharing the thoughts. It's also experiencing the experiences of another. How could God as a spirit experience mankind? 
he couldn't experience it in the spirit, so he became man. I'm thankful to know that the God that Isaiah was writing about in the Old Testament, that the God he wrote about who was the lawgiver and he was the judge is also Jesus Christ in the New Testament. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see a panel sitting on a throne, but we're going to see one that sits on the throne, and his name is Jesus. And he empathizes with us. And he, he doesn't just have cognitive empathy, but he has empathetic accuracy. You see, while empathy, it refers to an act of sharing in the emotional experience of another person, compassion is something different. Compassion adds to that emotional experience a desire to alleviate a person's distress. Oh, I'm thankful that God not only has empathetic accuracy, but He also has compassion. You see, when the Lord seen the crowd, when they were in distress, when when they were hurting, when, when they were sick, He was moved with compassion, and it moved Him to action. You see, Jesus, He humanly experienced both. In the flesh, Jesus experienced every temptation known to man, yet without sin. This gives Jesus the ability to fully identify with man and righteously judge with grace. You cannot judge with grace unless you have knowledge of the law, good self-awareness, great communication, and cognitive empathy. For compassion and empathy, they are both referring to a caring person to someone else's distress. Consider Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. And Jesus went forth, and he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. You see, because Jesus is both God and man, he is the perfect judge of mankind. For his judgment will be fair, his judgment will be perfectly just and not subject to appeal. We can be assured that Jesus is a fair judge and will enact judgment according to his wisdom and his righteousness. Oh, I'm thankful that Jesus Christ, I'm thankful that he can identify with you and I. I'm going to have Brother Anthony Gonzalez, if he would stand and read Isaiah chapter 11. Again, he's going to judge with his wisdom, but also his righteousness. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked." Again, he brought the child before the disciples. He says, if, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you need to become like a child. And he said, unless you be converted or unless you be changed, you will not inherit, you will not see the kingdom of God. Again, I, I want to become like a child because one day he's going to slay the wicked. He's going to judge those that live in evil, live in sin. But I'm thankful that God provided a way that we could escape that judgment by the precious blood of the Lamb. You see, because God is righteous, He cannot condone sin. He can neither tolerate wickedness among His creation, nor does He ignore its presence. For Jesus is obligated by His righteous nature neither to destroy that which is wicked or to take action to make His creation right. But God graciously, he determined not to destroy his creation, but make a plan of redemption available to mankind. And he did this and accomplished this redemptive act through the act of Calvary. When he went to Calvary, he redeemed us from sin. You see, grace made it possible for fallen humanity to be reunited with the Creator. It's because of the grace of God that we can be reconciled with Him. You see, for we are saved by grace. However, grace does not save us apart from obedient faith in Jesus. 
consider Ephesians chapter 2. And this is talking about being made alive in Christ. Brother Vincent Bird, he's going to stand and read part of the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. And you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Praise God. You didn't earn the grace of God. You didn't work to achieve the grace of God. But it's because of his great love that he extended his grace to you. I think we should just pause and thank God for his abundant riches of grace. Oh, there's levels of grace we haven't even discovered yet. Oh, hallelujah. I think we should thank God, lift up our voice, and give God a mighty praise for his grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice, for by grace you have been saved through faith, so it takes obedient faith. But also notice this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, somebody shout prepared, Prepared. beforehand so that we would walk in them. We need to walk in the grace of God. Grace saves us, but also grace gives us the power to continue to walk in his authority, walk in his strength. Walk in His power. Walk in His anointing. That's why we need to continuously grow in a grace. As we read through the letters to the early church, we would often see that the writers, they, they would begin to greet the church this way. Grace and peace be unto you, or grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Why? They had a keen understanding that grace not only saves us, but grace keeps us. And it's grace is going to give us a future when we stand before the throne of God. So here's a key understanding. God's grace does not end at redemption. But it should continue to work and be multiplied in the life of the believer. We can say it this way. Grace, it matures us. It helps us grow in faith. It helps us grow in endurance. It keeps us. It preserves us. Consider Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionary. It expands the meaning of grace beyond initial salvation. It descriptively defines grace as this. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life, including gratitude. We just thank God for His grace. We should grow in gratitude. We should grow in joy. We should grow in liberality. And we should grow in graciousness. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Why do we feel that liberty? When we come into a worship service and we begin to thank God, we begin to worship God, we're, we're thanking God for His goodness. We're, we're thanking God for His grace. We should feel the liberty of God. What is happening when we feel that liberty? God is allowing us to be transformed by multiplied grace. Oh, I want to go from grace to grace, strength from strength and from faith to faith. Oh, I know everybody here, you have a measure of faith. But I believe we can leave this service with a greater measure of faith by the grace of God. How many wants to leave here with a greater measure of faith? Oh, if you want a greater measure of faith, give God a greater measure of thanksgiving. 
Oh, hallelujah. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Go ahead and thank God. Go ahead and show God your gratitude. Go ahead and show God your joy. Oh, this is a day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a reflection on life, including gratitude. How do we grow in grace? We have a reflection of all that God has done for us. And we understand that's the unmerited favor of God. You see, certainly the early church, they had received God's redemptive grace. However, the Bible clearly indicates that the believers continue to grow in grace. Turn to somebody and say, you can grow in grace. You can grow in grace. I'm going to have Brother Louis Gonzalez. I'm going to show him some grace here. I caught him laughing on the platform, but I'm going to show him some grace. We're going to have you read. If we can get, oh, I'm skipping Brother Noe. Would you please show me some grace now? We're going to have Brother Noe read. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain. If you're gracious to other people, guess what? God is going to show you greater grace. We need to have a kind spirit to others. Praise God. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. What what happened? They were saved by... But how were they able to share the Word of God with boldness? It was the grace of God being multiplied in their life. We can grow in grace. And I pray that as a church we grow in that boldness that God can give through His grace. Verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Not just grace, but great grace. You see, the great grace described in this scripture passage, it was God's special favor toward those early believers which was something not necessarily experienced, hear me, by all believers. God extends His grace to every individual, but I believe that all of us can grow to different levels of grace. And I believe that God wants South Flint to grow to a level of great grace. You see, a mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost, it it enabled them to minister to their community in a mighty way. And they minister to their community through many miracles, through healing of the sick and proclaiming the Word of God. And it was these miracles and powerful demonstrations of the supernatural move of God which advanced Christ's kingdom beyond their human abilities. You see, Bible commentators, they suggest that the grace of God upon the early church was so obvious that the unbelieving community not only recognized God's presence, and preference upon his people. But they also respected the church because of such anointing from God was upon the church. Why? There was great grace that was being demonstrated upon the early church. And I believe we can walk in that great grace. It was Monday that we gathered here for prayer, and I'm so thankful for the the men and the women that that are able to come, and I know many you are working at that time, but it, it was a burden that was given to Brother Ron Larson almost uh, three years ago, and that prayer meeting is still going strong, and there's men and there's women that's able to come, and they come, and they support that faithfully. And, and I believe because of that prayer, God has placed a special anointing on South Flint Tabernacle. And this is a church, indeed, we're undergirded by prayer. and We never need to lose apostolic identity. And I'm not just talking about the the principles of holiness and standards, but we don't need to lose the practice of of praying together. So thank those that joined that prayer and those that 
that come early before prayer or before a service and you pray early in the prayer room. Thank you for that. I believe God favors that. I believe you're growing in the grace of God and the grace of God can be multiplied through that. But it was after that, that uh, prayer meeting that uh, at the conclusion of that, I talked about that, that we are the temple of God. And the Apostle Paul writing to the church, he said, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the, the Holy Spirit dwelleth in you. We need to recognize that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And that Spirit, it not only gives us purpose, but it also it gives us power. But it allows the grace of God to be multiplied in our life. And I simply, we concluded that prayer, gave some direction and said, we want to pray that, that God would open a door of opportunity. You see, writing to the church of Colossians, the Apostle Paul, he said, I want you to remind Archippus. I want you to remind him to take heed of the ministry that has been given to him through Jesus Christ. I want you to remind him of that and that he would fulfill it. He would fulfill the ministry. When you receive the Holy Ghost, God gives us the power to fulfill the purpose and the power that he has put in our life. And that's to be a witness to our community. And after that prayer, we prayed this, God, would you open up a door of opportunity? And uh, after that, everyone went home, and I was so excited. Sister Kay Burgoyne, thank you for being an example of God's holiness and, and God's identity and God's presence. She went into a store, and, and she texted Lady McGee. I believe you begin to have a conversation with a lady. And, and she just began to recognize. She said, you're a Christian. She said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And Sister Burgoyne said, I am. And she said, I, I, I can tell. I, I can see it. And Sister Burgoyne said, yeah, that, that's because I just became, I just came back from a prayer meeting. She said, no, it's all over you. I'll dance myself. What was she saying? I see the grace of God all over you. I see the presence of God all over you. We need to get so on fire for God that the community sees it on us. Oh, give God some praise. Go ahead, thank God for His grace. Oh, what are you doing, Pastor? I'm just thanking God for His grace. I'm thanking Him for His presence. Multiply your grace in South Flint Tabernacle. It's all over you. Can people see the grace of God all over you? The early church, it was all over them. Ha-ha! Could you just entertain the presence of God? It swept in in a powerful way. We need to respond to the grace that we're feeling. God is multiplying it right now. If you want to receive some greater grace, God is multiplying it right now. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Ikorambata. Men are always to pray, lifting up holy hands. Ah. Stir up the gift that is in thee. Come on, stir up the power of the Holy Ghost. We need to pray in the Holy Ghost. If this turns into a prayer meeting, that's all right. The early church was birthed in prayer. Where's my prayer warriors? Oh, this church was birthed in prayer. Ikorambata, idorambasata. Oh, come on, church. God is multiplying grace right now. Grace and peace be multiplied in you. Let there be an impartation of your power, an impartation of your grace. Ah, would you connect with a brother or sister beside you and begin to pray? Say, God, multiply your grace. Multiply it. That's it. Multiply it, God. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Oh, hallelujah. God, multiply your grace in our youth. 
Multiply it and thrive. Multiply it in bus ministry. Multiply it in greeters ministry. Multiply it in jail ministry. Multiply it, God. Multiply it in Bible studies. Multiply it, God. Ha-ha. Multiply it in personal evangelism. Multiply it, God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you want to yield yourself to be a living sacrifice, you can pray where you're at, but come to the altar. Lift up your hands and just begin to yield yourself. Say, God, I want to be a living sacrifice. Oh, hallelujah. That's it, young people. If you want to be a living sacrifice, come to the altar. Lift up your hands. Yes. We're going to turn this into a prayer meeting. Jesus said, Terry, I want you to tarry tonight until you be endued with power from on high. Oh, yes, we did it multiplied. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Ah, yes. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. If you need the Holy Ghost, you can receive it right now. If you need deliverance, you can receive it right now. Ha ha. Yes. Come on, prayer warriors. Lift up your voice. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Oh, yes, this is reasonable. Oh, this might be strange to the world, but this is reasonable. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes, that's it. Lift up your voice. What do you need here tonight? Do you need healing in your body? God is here to extend grace. God, give us greater boldness. Give us greater favor with the community. Give great grace. <laughs> grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Uh, give us greater knowledge of you, God. Let us grow in faith. Yes, God. Oh, let us add faith to that grace. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. God, would you add virtue to our faith? Add power to our faith. Add grace to our faith. And to our faith and our virtue, add knowledge. Give us greater knowledge of who you are. You are the one lawgiver. You are the one judge. Yes, Lord. Add unto our life temperance. Add unto our life moderation, God. Add into our life patience. Yes, God, give us a patient with the lost. Yes, 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 give us long suffering. Give us great grace. God, give us a godliness. Give us a holiness. God, let us fall in love with holiness. Yes, God, add to our life brotherly kindness. God, add to your people brotherly kindness. And the brotherly kindness, Lord, add love. Yes, let love grow. Let love abound. Yes, give us the ability to minister beyond ourselves. Give us the ability to minister to our community, God. Ah, yes.
<laughs> if you're the head of your home, pray over your home. If you're the head of your home, pray over it. Take dominion. Take authority over your family. Kata. Come on, take dominion. The grace of God gives us dominion and authority over sin. But grace also gives us the ability to take dominion. Yes, yes. If you're the only apostolic believer in your family, take dominion over it. That's it. There, there's a spirit of intercession. A spirit of intercession. It breathed into this service. That's it. Holy Ghost intercede. Ah, yes, yes. The Spirit of God, it's multiplying grace. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I believe God can give you a greater measure of faith. I said that earlier in the Holy Ghost. It wasn't in my notes, but I believe God can give you a greater measure of faith. If you want it, receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. A greater measure of faith.
Hallelujah. Don't be surprised that after this season of prayer, if someone doesn't acknowledge, I see something different on you. You see, the, the Spirit of God, grace works through the Spirit of God. And I'm not going to try to teach the, the remainder of the Bible today. I believe the Holy Ghost was teaching. I want you to read through the remainder of the notes because we will find that the power of God, the grace of God is a continual teacher. We should allow the Spirit of God and the grace of God to continuously teach us. But I want to share something, then I'm going to turn it over to Bishop. You can remain where you're at, standing or sitting, whatever you're comfortable with. But Sunday evening at the Celebrating Our Heritage Service, the Lord had already laid this on my heart, and Bishop mentioned something. It was a power, two powerful statements, but I believe it was connected with the grace of God. And he said this, he said, God does not ask from you more than what you are able. That is the grace of God. But we should never be satisfied with where we are. Because the grace of God can be multiplied. And I believe the grace of God was just multiplied in a supernatural way. When we opened up to God, God was doing the teaching the, and the imparting. But then he said this, God does not ask from you more than you, what you're able to do. But then he said this, but the Lord never excludes you from that which is beyond your ability. You see, the grace of God will never put more upon you than you're able to handle. But also, the grace of God says, if you're not satisfied with where you are, you can receive more from God. How many wants to receive more from God? Just thank God for his word as our bishop comes. Thank God for his word. Thank God for his grace.